<clears throat> trigonometry, chapter five, trigonometric identities, section two, verifying trigonometric identities, video one, important algebraic maneuvers. This series is based on content from Pearson's Trigonometry 12th edition by Lau, Hornsby, Schneider, and Daniels. In the previous section, we explored fundamental identities and ways to use them. Specifically, we reviewed Pythagorean identities, reciprocal identities, quotient identities, and even odd identities. We use these to calculate the values of trig functions, rewrite functions in terms of other functions, and simplify trig expressions. In this section, we explore how to verify trigonometric identity. In this video, we categorize important algebraic maneuvers we will encounter as we verify trig identities. In other words, sometimes you have to do algebra when you're doing trig. For example, one move, and I did not know that these were on here, is factoring. Uh, the most common factoring moves we will encounter are factoring out a greatest common factor and factoring a difference of squares. For example, factor the greatest common factor out of sine cubed x plus sine x cosine squared x. When you're looking for greatest common factor, you're looking at each term, each part of the addition problem to see if they have any factors in common. In this case, they have signs in common. The common factor in this is just sine of x. So we're going to undistribute. We're going to factor out the sine of x. And when we factor sine of x out of that, and sorry, I forgot these were still here. When we factor the sine of x out of that, get my highlighter going. When we factor a sine of x out of sine cubed, we get sine squared. And when we factor a sine of x out of sine x cosine squared x, we have just cosine of x. And the greatest common factor is put in front. So it factors to give sine of x times sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x. Now, you should recognize that sum as part of a Pythagorean identity that equals 1. So this simplifies to sine of x times 1, which is just, of course, sine of x. Another factoring technique is difference of squares. For example, let's factor sine squared minus cosine squared. A binomial of the form a squared minus b squared factors into a minus b times a plus b. So sine squared minus cosine squared factors into sine x minus cosine x times sine x plus cosine x. The thing highlighted in green, know it. Difference of squares factors into a difference times a sum. Now, this formula applies to the difference of any even powers. For example, if we had sine to the sixth power of x minus cosine to the sixth power of x, we could treat that like a square because any, any even power can be written as half the power squared. So sine to the sixth power of x is the same as sine to the third power of x squared, same with cosine, and so we can factor it into sine cubed of x minus cosine cubed of x times sine cubed of x plus cosine cubed of x. Second algebraic maneuver, adding fractions by getting common denominators, which is how you add fractions. For example, if we wanted to add 1 over sine x plus 1 over cosine x, we would simply have to multiply both fractions by the necessary version of 1 to get a common denominator or just multiply each fraction by on both sides by the other fraction's denominator. For the first fraction, 1 over sine x, we'd multiply it by cosine x over cosine x. For the second fraction, 1 over cosine x, we'd multiply it by sine x over sine x. That's because it sets up the same multiplication problem in the denominators, which guarantees common denominators. And when we do this, we would get cosine x over the first, over sine x cosine x, plus sine x over sine x cosine x, and when we combine them, we get cosine x plus sine x over sine x cosine x. Uh, algebraically, it's a pretty easy maneuver. You can always get, achieve common denominators by forming the product of the existing denominators. Now, you'd be tempted to cancel in this answer. Don't. You cannot cancel parts of addition problems in fractions. Technique number three, maneuver number three, splitting fractions across their numerator's terms. For example, let's simplify sine squared x minus cosine squared x over sine x cosine x. We can do this by uncombining them, unadding them, and putting each term in the numerator into its own fraction 
over the same common denominator. Doing this removes the minus sign from the numerator, puts it between the fractions, and now makes both fractions eligible for reducing. The first fraction we can reduce by sine x, the second fraction by cosine x, and we would get sine x over cosine x minus cosine x over sine x. And if you're on your game, you recognize that both of these are quotient identities and would simplify further to tangent x minus cotangent x. Number four, multiplying binomials. Not going to go through all these, um, but you should be able to multiply binomials, specifically when you square a binomial, like a, a plus b squared. If you don't know that it's equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, that's okay. Write it twice, foil it out, and be careful. The worst thing you can do, and I see this all the time at all levels, is to assume that you can take something like a plus b squared and distribute the square. That is bad, that is bad, that is bad. Don't ever do it. Don't ever distribute a square across a plus or minus. So when you run across multiplication of binomials, you can just write it twice and foil it. And lastly, multiplying both sides of a fraction by a conjugate. I almost made a separate video for this, but I wanted to put all the algebraic maneuvers in one video. So this video is a little bit longer than I would like for it to be. Now, if you don't know what a conjugate is, the addition problem a plus b and the subtraction problem a minus b are known as conjugates. And the reason conjugates are convenient is because their product is the difference of squares. This can transform a binomial of trig functions into a binomial of squared trig functions, this should say of, and hence make a Pythagorean identity an option. For example, let's rewrite 1 minus sine x over 1 plus sine x without fractions. Without any other guidance, if you wanted to make the fractions disappear, the plus in the bottom is an obstacle. Because if the bottom were a single term, we could split the fractions like we did here. Anytime the denominator is a single term, we can split across the numerator and reduce. But in this fraction, we don't have a single term in the denominator. We have 1 plus sine of x. But the best way to handle this is to create a single term in the denominator. Okay, I just said all this. So we're going to hit the denominator with the conjugate. We're going to multiply both sides of this fraction by the conjugate of the denominator. The denominator is 1 plus sine x. Its conjugate is 1 minus sine x. If we FOIL both of those, on the top we would get 1 minus 2 sine x plus sine squared x. And on the bottom we would get 1 minus sine squared x. But 1 minus sine squared x is a variation of a Pythagorean identity, and that's equal to cosine squared of x. Now, we haven't gotten without fractions yet, but now the denominator has one term. That's critical, because now we can split across the numerator. So let's do that. Each piece of the numerator gets its own denominator. Okay, now what are we going to do with this? Well... With this, we could capitalize on the reciprocal identity, secant of x equals 1 over cosine of x, and tangent of x equals sine over x over cosine of x to eliminate all the fractions. These are the two identities that involve cosine and a denominator. Now, you may want to rewrite the three individual terms that you see like this. So watch closely. The first term, 1 over cosine squared x, becomes the square of 1 over cosine x. The last term, sine squared over cosine squared, becomes the square of sine over cosine. But the middle one takes a little bit more finesse because we only have a single trig function on the top, the sine, but we have two trig functions on the bottom. So we're going to make two fractions, one that has a sine on top, one that has a one on top. One that has a sine on top, one that has a one on top. So as a consequence of that split and this rewrite, which was not necessary, but may help you see what's about to happen, everything in parentheses becomes a single trig function. The one over cosines become secant, the sines over cosines become tangents, and we get this. And we have successfully written the expression without fractions. <clears throat> if you're really on top of your algebra game, you'll recognize that this factors into secant x minus tangent of x. But those are the five algebraic uh, maneuvers that I could think of as if we run across more, I'll point them out in the following videos.